Well, it's really easy to enjoy working with Randy Frazee for a multiple of reasons. I we'll love the way he loves San Antonio, the way he's leading our church into our neighborhood ministries. But I got to tell you, sometimes I scratch my head at these sermon series he comes up with. <laughs> Jesus for president. What a great idea. What a great idea. Randy and Roseanne are celebrating the graduation of their son Stephen this weekend. So I'm happy to step in and and make one installment in this four or five part series of messages entitled Jesus for President. There's a handout, I'm sorry, an outline in your handout. You might want to get something ready to write with and have the handout ready so you can fill in the blanks. <clears throat> There's also a prayer card that will play an important part at the conclusion of the message. So if you could just have this handy, I'll be referring to it here in just a moment. It is election time in America. I don't know what you think about election season. My hunch is that some of you struggle with what I struggle with, and that is just a tad of cynicism. It's easy to grow weary with Washington. It's almost like this is a sophisticated version of Braveheart. <laughs> yeah, one group up on one ridge, another group up on the other ridge, and they're yelling and catcalling and for the next few months, they're going to be attacking each other and throwing mud and making accusations, and it's going to get tacky, tacky, tacky. Sometimes you just think you'd find more maturity in a daycare than you find in these <laughs> political conversations. It's easy, it's easy to grow cynical. It's just as easy to grow fearful, isn't it? You know, we're concerned about our country. We're concerned. What a summer we've had. Who would ever thought that you'd go to a movie and get shot? Or to a house of worship like the folks in Wisconsin and get slaughtered? These are difficult days. Violence seems everywhere. No one, it seems, really has a solution to the global economy and how fragile it is. And this plummeting morality we see I don't consider myself that old and really not that old-fashioned. But even in, in my life, the things that were prohibited and unthinkable just a couple of decades ago are normal and accepted now on television. Top three selling books in America today are pornography on the New York Times list. We can't agree with God's definition of a family. We can't stand up for the rights of the preborn. Layer upon layer, it's enough to leave a person fretting and anxious about the future of the country. But I'm here today with a message of hope, a message of hope. Because we can let others be anxious and let others argue, let others even be divisive. But we have discovered something in the pages of Scripture, in God's working through history, and that is simply this, that it matters less about who occupies the White House. What matters most is he who occupies the throne. That our Heavenly Father is over the nations and that he uses the nations, our nation and all nations, to accomplish his perfect will. And the believer comes to see politics through a different lens. Not through the actions of voters, but really through the hand of God in the sovereign plan of God. I don't know if you've ever flipped through your Bible looking for the examples of God managing the hearts of those in authority, but it's a fascinating study. It's a study I'd like for us to engage in for a few moments this morning, how God rules the nations. Pray with me, and then we'll get to work. Most Heavenly Father, have mercy upon us now as we open your scriptures. Will you open our hearts? And will you please forgive the sins of the one who speaks? They are many. Please help us to see Jesus and just Jesus. And through his name we pray. Amen. Imagine the following situation. It's post-Civil War America. You, your family, and your ancestors have known nothing but slavery for the last few generations. You've spent countless days underneath the hot southern sun picking cotton or working the plantation. 
Then comes the Emancipation Proclamation. You and your family are slaves no longer. You're free to go. It's great news on one hand, but disconcerting news on the other. I mean, how, how can you make a living now? Where can you go? You don't have any possessions. You don't own any property. You don't have access to any money. Well, someone in your family comes up with this idea, and that is, let's go to the plantation owner and ask him to provide us all of our needs to start a new life. Well, the only thing more bizarre than the request is the fulfillment thereof. You go to the former slave owner, the plantation owner, and you say, could we have the wagons and the livestock and the candlesticks? Could we have all that to take with us? And he says, yes. He says, yes. Who would have ever thought that he would say yes. It's the most bizarre thing you've ever heard of. Some of you are thinking, yeah, but that's, a, that's also one of the most biblical things I've heard of as well. Do you remember the story of the children of Israel who were slaves in Egypt for 400 years? When we studied the life of Joseph, you remember that Joseph moved them to Egypt for protection. You may not know they stayed there 400 years, and many of those years later on were years in which they were slaves. The Egyptian people became the masters of the Hebrew people. In the last few years were an arduous, difficult, backbreaking service. God declared an emancipation proclamation, and his version of an Abraham Lincoln was Moses, and Moses was sent from the mountain where he was a shepherd, back to Egypt where he had served as prince. He's 80 years old, and before he is sent back to release, declare the release of the Hebrew people, God gives him some instructions. Have you noticed what God told Moses? He said, I will use my great power against Egypt, and I will strike Egypt with all the miracles that will happen in that land. And after I do... He, will, speaking of Pharaoh, will let you go. Now look at this. I will cause the Egyptians to think well of the Israelites. So when you leave, they will give gifts to your people. Each woman should ask her Egyptian neighbor and any Egyptian woman living in her house for gifts, silver, gold, clothing. And you should put those gifts on your children when you leave. And this way you will take with you the riches of the Egyptians. <laughs> well, who would have thought? Moses goes back to Egypt, and you remember the story, how the ten plagues led to the liberation of the people. Pharaoh finally consents, and the people are released. And then look at this. The Lord caused the Egyptians to think well of them, and the Egyptians gave the people everything they asked for. So the Israelites took rich gifts from them. The Israelites traveled from Ramesses to Succoth. There were about 600,000 men walking, not including the women and the children. So about a million people leave Egypt, not just with their freedom, but with the possessions. They live with, leave with all of the wealth, all of the possessions of the Egyptian people. It was giveaway day in Egypt. The Hebrew slaves, former slaves, went up to their Egyptian former masters and said, we're leaving, I'm going to take your Mercedes with me and uh, and I'm going to take that stereo system. And, and while I'm at it, all those clothes, I guess I'll just load them up too. And the Egyptians said, okay, it's yours. God had softened the hearts of the oppressors toward the oppressed. Why did this happen? Because of the persuasion of Moses? No. Because of the strategy of Pharaoh? No. Because God managed and oversaw the hearts of of the Egyptians. God was over the nation. Now maybe you need that reminder. Maybe you need that reminder because you may have fallen into the common thought that says that really it's the president or the dictator or the king who leads the nation. According to scripture, there is a power higher than he or she overseeing everything. The believer looks at politics through a different lens. We believe first and foremost that God is the God of the nations. That God 
is the God of the nations. Washington doesn't call the shots. God does. Congress doesn't direct the future. God does. The Bible is chock full of illustrations of this verse from Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. As casually as a farmer would dig a canal through which the water would pass into his crops, so God directs the thoughts and the deeds of those in positions of authority. He did this in Egypt. That's just one of many examples in the Bible. I'd like to share with you very briefly four others. If you like to fill in blanks, this is your time. Consider the story of Cyrus. Cyrus. He was the king of Persia. Listen to this verse from the book of Ezra. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout the realm and put it in writing. Just pause there. Now, in our day of elected officials and checks and balance and Supreme Court justices and We may not appreciate the absolute power that a man like Cyrus had, especially being the king of Persia. When he spoke, folks, it happened. He consulted nobody. He needed no one's approval. When he spoke, it happened. But when God spoke to Cyrus, it happened. Now, the Bible's interesting. It gives us this interesting detail about Cyrus. Cyrus was not a lover of God or a fearer of God. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, there's just a little one first reference to this moment. But God says, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you Cyrus by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. So Cyrus was not seeking God, but that didn't matter to God. God still used Cyrus. A nation is blessed when it has godly leaders. A nation enjoys the fruit of of prayerful men and women as they lead the country. But even if a nation does not have a godly leader, that nation can still be led by God because he controls the hearts of the kings. He directs what happens. Another couple of examples. Here's one of Daniel. Daniel and the Babylonian official. You'll remember that Daniel was taken into captivity as a young man taken into Babylonia. And one of his requests was that he wouldn't eat all the fat foods, fattening foods, not fat foods, but fattening foods that were served by the king in the castle of Babylonia in the empire. He wanted to have his own diet. Well, we don't think that's that big of a request. But when you read verse 10 of the first chapter, you find out that if the official says yes, he's taking his life into his own hands. But in verse 9, he gives in to the request. Now, God caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. Why did he say yes to Daniel? Because God, operating through leaders, changed and softened the heart of the official in the direction of Daniel. God did something similar in the life of Nehemiah. Nehemiah and King Artaxerxes. Let's all say that name together. Artaxerxes. I'm still waiting for somebody to name their son Artaxerxes. That's a great name. Artaxerxes, come to dinner. Artaxerxes. This is not. Call him Artie for short. So Nehemiah, if you remember in the story of Nehemiah, it begins, the story does, with the bad news that Nehemiah received, that the walls of the city had been broken down. The walls of Jerusalem had been destroyed and the gates had been burned. In other words, the city of Jerusalem was vulnerable to attack. Well, Nehemiah, a Jew with a heart for Jerusalem, wanted to help, but he couldn't help. You know why? Because he was the right-hand man of King Artaxerxes. He was the cupbearer, which means he was the most trusted official in the king's court. And the only way that he could ever lend any help at all to Jerusalem would be with the blessing of the king. But why in the world would the king release his most reliable servant and most dependable servant to go to the distant outpost of Jerusalem and do any work? It doesn't make any sense at all. And so 
Nehemiah began to pray. Here was his prayer. He said, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. This man was the king. So Nehemiah, who was essentially in the Oval Office with the king, was praying every day. He was asking God to soften the heart of Nehemiah toward the concerns and the needs of Jerusalem. Does anybody know how long he prayed? Nine months. Nine months he prayed every single day. He never even made a request until one day King Artaxerxes said to Nehemiah, now why are you looking so sad? You just look so sad lately. Well, Nehemiah was dreadfully afraid, <clears throat> excuse me, that the, the king might be upset when he told him the reason. But he offered a quick prayer and he told him about Jerusalem. He told him how the walls were destroyed. He told him how the gates had been burned down. And he told him how he had a heart to go back and help his people. So you know what King Artaxerxes said? King said, what do you request? What do you request? Basically, he gave him the checkbook. All the checks already signed. He said, whatever you need. Nehemiah made his request. He asked for soldiers. He asked for horses. He asked for letters of endorsement. And he asked for money. And he asked for supplies. And the king said, yes, 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 yes. Why? Because God had softened his heart toward the need. One more example. I think this is an interesting one. And that is the Hebrews and their prayer pilgrimage. The Hebrews and their prayer pilgrimage. This is so briefly appears in Scripture that many people have never noticed it. But God gave this command to the children of Israel once they inhabited the promised land after they were delivered from Egyptian captivity. He said, three times a year, all your men are to appear before the sovereign Lord, <clears throat> excuse me, the God of Israel. And I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory. And no one will covet your land when you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. Now think about this command for just a second. God says, okay, I want all the men to gather at one place for a time of worship three times a year. Leave your farms, leave your commerce, leave your work, leave your posts, leave wherever you were. I want everyone gathered in one place three times a year for worship. Now, can you imagine some of the concerns that the people had? The farmers thinking, I can't just go off and leave my farm. Uh, those guarding the borders would think, I cannot just go off and leave my post. Uh, those in charge of, 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 of merchants the merchants in charge of places of commerce were thinking, I can't just go off and leave. My caravan's unprotected. My camel's unprotected. I just can't go off and leave everything like that. And to comfort them, did you notice what God said to them? He said, no one will covet your land when you go up. No one will covet your land. In other words, I'm going to secure your borders. I'm going to protect your land. When you come to worship me, you place me first. I'm going to protect your land in the meantime. You don't have to worry. No one's even going to want your checking account. What a declaration for God to make. God controls the desires even of the neighboring countries or the neighboring clans or the neighboring enemies. He controls the impulses of people. So can we tally this up for just a minute? Who prompted the Egyptians to give supplies to the former Hebrew slaves? God did. Who prompted Cyrus to issue the command? God did. Who prompted the official in the Babylonian court to grant Daniel's request? You can answer. God did. Who prompted King Arty or King Artaxerxes? To rebuild the walls of Jerusalem? God did. Who walked up, watched over the lands of the Hebrews as they went to gather three times a year for worship? God did. Who led the hearts of the kings and protected the people? God did and God does. God does. God is over the nations. That's why David, King David, in one of his prayers said these words. 
O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand. No one can withstand you. Isn't that comforting news? I've heard it this week. I've heard it several times over the last few weeks. You've heard it. Maybe you've even said it. The phrase goes something like this. If President Obama wins this election, our nation is going down the tubes. Or if Mitt Romney wins this election, it's all over for our country. Really? Really? Is heaven really troubled about this election? Is God having trouble getting his angels to get a good night's rest because they're so anxious about what's going to happen on November the 6th? Does heaven incline its ear to the actions of elephants and donkeys? I don't think so either. Listen, let others be anxious. Let others get their lives tied up in knots. Let others cast their lots with their resident of the Oval Office. Here's what we do as children of God. We vote. We think. We pay attention. We develop opinions. We pay our taxes. We do our civil duty. Some of you even get engaged in campaigning for a certain person, maybe even running for office yourself. But what we don't do is freak out. We just don't freak out because we know that no matter who is in the Oval Office, God is on the throne. Amen? Amen. Or to put it in a sentence, we place our trust in the work of God. We place our trust in the work of God. How many nations has he seen come and go? How many kings has he seen stand and fall? How many presidents has he seen elected and then placed out of office? He's not troubled. And because we believe in him, we're not troubled either. I'm just like all of you. I love being a citizen of the United States of America. I really do. I really do. But I love even more being a citizen of heaven. And long after, long after this dispensation of history has discontinued and this time of history has run its course, we'll look back at the time that we were citizens of the United States and we'll be grateful. But even at that time, we will always be citizens of heaven because we have cast our ultimate hope with Jesus Christ who is on the throne. So what do we do in the meantime? Well, of course we don't worry. Of course we vote. Of course we do all the things we mentioned. But there's one assignment that we have been given that I'm going to conclude with that is absolutely essential. And that is this. We pray. We pray. Your Bible contains the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote to a young pastor by the name of Timothy. 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy are really like church workbooks because what Paul was telling Timothy is here's how you lead a church here's how I want the church to behave so they're very practical pragmatic books in first Timothy Paul tells Timothy the first thing the church is supposed to do and he says this first of all I desire that petitions and prayers and thanksgiving be made for all people and look at this for kings and those in authority. That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good. And pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So the flagship assignment of Paul to Timothy was to pray. So the initial assignment of the church is to pray. 
And then the first group for whom the church prays is the king and those in positions of authority. Or in our case, we pray for the president and the vice president and the senate and the congress and the governors and the mayor, all the people in positions of authority. This is the assignment given to God's people. We offer prayers. If you're a Republican, you pray. If you're a Democrat, you pray. If you're a Libertarian, you pray. If you're independent, you pray. If you don't know what you are, you pray. We pray. This is the assignment, the blanket assignment, the universal assignment given to all children of God. Our assignment during an election season is to be people of prayer. We intercede and we ask God to pray for the leaders of our country. Did you know that the Bible says that all government leaders are actually servants of God, whether they want to be or not? Have you seen this verse in Romans chapter 13? There is no authority except that which God established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. For the ruler is God's servant to do you good. The purpose of a government is to to create a greenhouse beneath which the citizens can develop physically, spiritually, and mentally. A safe society in which people can grow, discover their God, and discover each other and grow in faith. That's the purpose of the government. And so the government plays an important role in creating a safe greenhouse in which people can develop and people can grow. And leaders in the government are God's servants. And our job is to pray for them. And I want to challenge you, really commission you to take this call to prayer very seriously. This year I'm heading up a presidential election campaign prayer movement. And I'd like for you to be the first to agree to pray. We're going to have 40 days of prayer beginning September the 28th leading up to November the 6th. That's the day of the presidential election. September 28th to November the 6th. And we're inviting people all over the nation, yes, all over the world, to agree to pray every day in harmony or in the same spirit that the Lord would bless us and guide us during this presidential election. We're asking people to pray for three things. Number one, Lord, unite us. Unite our country. We're weary of being divided and polarized. Will you unite us? Number two, will you strengthen us? We just strengthen us, strengthen our economy, strengthen our resolve, strengthen our morality. And then number three, will you appoint and anoint our next president? We want who you want, God. That's what we want, right? We want you, dear Father, to appoint and then anoint our next president. Now, that's an easy prayer to remember. Unite, strengthen, anoint, appoint. U-S-A. And I'd encourage you to be among the first to agree to offer this prayer for 40 days in a row. You can go to oakhillschurch.com or you can go to maxlocato.com backslash election. And there you'll just have a place you can sign up to commit to pray. We're going to go public with this in the next week or two. We wanted you here at the Oak Hills Church family to be among the first to sign up to do exactly that. That's what this prayer card is that's in your weekend handout. It's just a way for you to remind yourself and remind others. Put this in a very visible place. I know September 28th is still some days away, so maybe put it on your calendar or somewhere where you'll see it, and then the prayer is on the back. Because down deep, don't we believe that God gave us a great promise? We conclude with 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And all God's people said, Dear Heavenly Father, would you help us to be people of prayer, people of faith. We thank you for the unspeakable privilege of living in the United States. We thank you for those who have died to make this possible. We agree, Father, that this is a blessed nation. And you have looked upon us with kindness. Father, we have concerns about the future. 
We ask you to raise up the leaders who will have the answers to guide us into the next generation. Heavenly Father, we know that you know that person and you know those people. We place this decision in your hands. We pray, Father, that you would unite our country and that you would please create a spirit of cooperation and peace so that we can have what you want for us and that is a peaceful society. We thank you, Lord, for the comfort that comes from knowing that you are on the throne. And we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. And all the church said...